Welcome. Hi, I'm Mickey, and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners, and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness, and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Hey everyone, it's Mickey here. You're listening to Wikipedia, and this week on the podcast, I have the pleasure of talking to Professor Peter Sterling about the allostatic stress load and its impact on health. The term allostasis has been coined to clarify ambiguities associated with the word stress, and it refers to the adaptive processes that maintain homeostasis through the production of mediators such as adrenaline, cortisol, and other chemical messengers. And I don't doubt that you listening into this today are well familiar with those stress hormones and the potential impact on health. And Dr. or Professor Sterling, who is the author of What is Health? Allostasis and the Evolution of Human Design, coined the term with Joseph Ayer as a different way of looking at stress in our response to stress. Now, we have such a great conversation because Professor Sterling has such an interesting background with his focus on neuroanatomy, physiology, psychology, and human behavior slash social issues. And we discuss some of his very early background as his parents were somewhat of activists um, and how this then led to the career path that Peter took, which was quite unusual at the time. We also discuss how his informal anthropological research taught him about the stress response and the pillars of health that he then went on to write about. And it's interesting to think that once upon a time, we didn't think about stress the way that we do now. And Professor Sterling was really sort of at the helm of our I suppose our understanding of stress and how it has changed over time. So Professor Peter Sterling, he's a professor of neuroscience, got his degrees in biology at Cornwall University in 1961 and in medicine at New York University School of Medicine, 1962, and then finally his neuroscience degree or PhD at Western Reserve University in 1966. And his broad goal with his research has been to learn how the brain is designed. So his the functional architecture of it. And he's done a range of different, both sort of clinical or laboratory studies, and then also looking at social behavior as well. So his theoretical interests extended to basic issues of physiological regulation and behavior, leading to the concept of aleostasis. And Professor Sterling sort of divides his time in between a lifestyle block in Panama and also Pennsylvania. And I've got in our show notes a link to his book, What is Health, and also to Google Scholar and a list of his publications, some of which have been cited several thousand times. So he really is a thought leader in this area. So just a reminder, before we crack on into the podcast, the best way to support this podcast is to hit the subscribe button on your favorite podcast listening platform. That increases the visibility of the podcast out there in amongst the literally thousands of other podcasts, so more people get the opportunity to learn from guests that I have on the show. And if you felt like leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, that would be all right with me. All right, team, please enjoy this conversation that I have with Professor Peter Sterling. Peter, thank you so much for taking the time, your afternoon, to speak to me about your work in this field. Super fascinating listening to your talk on aleostasis, probably haven't said that properly actually, um, health, but also how you arrived at the place that you got to with regards to your career and your personal experience. Um, Can we begin a little bit with your background so the listener gets an idea of that? Sure. So how did I get into this? Well, um, I grew up uh, in a suburb um, 
just north of New York City. Uh, I was born in the 1940s, so I'm as I'm speaking to you, I was 83 yesterday. Oh, and, happy birthday for yesterday. Yeah, yes, exactly. Um, thank you. So um, I grew up in, it was country then. It was, uh, there were woods and fields and so on. And my mother was interested in nature and encouraged mm -hmm. me to be that way. And uh, she wrote, uh, she wrote, both my parents were writers and she wrote books mm -hmm. about nature. And both of my parents were um, members of the U.S. Communist Party, actually, bet oh. between about uh, 1935 and 1955, when it didn't make sense anymore. And uh, yeah. so they they were dedicated to uh, working against uh, racism in the U.S. There was massive racial se segregation. There was lynching and, and so on. And so um, I I bought into that passion as well yeah so um so from when i went to college i i studied zoology biology uh, very intensely and uh and i i organized uh various activities against against racism and so was that unusual peter at the time or <laughs> i guess you would surround yourself with people who are like-minded i imagine well i i tr yeah, there were a few other. So we were called uh, the term here developed later, uh, red diaper baby, uh, the, the children, the children of uh, American communists. And uh, so. So, yes, uh, we, we were a very small minority, but we, um, we we were trying to educate and recruit uh, companions in this. So um, mm -hmm. so I submitted my first scientific report from uh, to my advisor at Cornell University and then I uh, I, I drove with some older uh, graduate students down to Mississippi to join the Freedom Rides and mm -hmm. the Freedom Rides even even US uh, younger people don't re recall this is 1961 was an effort yeah. was an effort to bring particularly students from all over the country, black and white together to converge on Jackson, Mississippi, um, by buses or trains uh, to integrate the lunch, integrate the eating facilities and the restrooms and so on, and to uh, to force the Kennedy administration. This was John F. Kennedy was president. His brother, uh, Robert Kennedy, was uh, attorney general, and to force to embarrass mm -hmm. them basically to just signing signing off saying there will be no more uh, segregation in interstate travel. How big was that um, rally, Peter? So uh, that's a good question. So I, I looked this up a few years ago. Um, it, over across the summer, for we arrived in May. It started in May. By uh, it, it, the people arrived all during the summer, and by uh, November, uh, the Kennedys actually signed the thing, and and interstate travel was desegregated. The number of people involved was only four hundred riders. Four hundred. Oh. It was wow. it was a one percent of all the students that could have gone. It was a very yeah. small number, and yeah. uh, and many of them were actually uh, red diaper babies. Not not all by any means, but but uh, certainly the white the white ones from the north. Many yeah. were. Yeah. So did this mean that you were part of the rally for that amount of time? I continued. Uh, I went from. From uh, shortly uh, after that, uh, to graduate school in neuroscience in Cleveland, Ohio, and I, I did the same thing. I worked in the laboratory, and and I often would slip away from my microscope. I was a neuroanatomist, and um, and uh, be involved in in canvassing in black neighborhoods uh, as a member of the Congress on Racial Equality (CORE). It was called. Yeah. And yeah. Wow. And so, Peter, with your, when did you sort of get an interest in the brain and wanting to study more about what was going on there? I, I think uh, when I was a student at Cornell, um, my junior year, I took a course in neuroanatomy and uh, with a very inspiring man. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I sort of committed myself, my interest to to the brain. And so that's what I did in graduate school. And after graduate school, uh, school in Cleveland. We moved in 1966 to Harvard Medical School 
to study with a pair of uh, neuroscientists named Hugh, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel. Uh, and I was their first postdoc, among one of their two first postdocs. And in a period, 15 years later, they, they got the Nobel Prize. So, um, so it was a very exciting period uh, at, at, in, their, in their lab. Yeah. What would, and what did they get the Nobel Prize for? So uh, this is a period where people were just beginning to investigate the activity of neurons uh, in the uh, in the cerebral cortex by poking tiny, tiny microelectrodes into the brain, recording the impulses of a single neuron. If you listen to it on an audio amplifier and you shined a light across, moved it across the screen, you'd hear pop, 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 like that. And if you moved it back, maybe nothing, pop, pop, pop nothing. And so those were cells that were clearly computing the direction of motion. Okay? Yeah. And there were there were many, many uh, such studies. And they, they sort of pioneered in these studies. And uh, they also studied the anatomical uh, architecture underlying this stuff. I, uh, my partner, uh, and I chose a different part of the brain. And they, they, they didn't encourage us to to mess up their studies in the in the <laughs> cortex, so they uh, so we chose to study a part of the midbrain called the superior colliculus, with the same approach. And yeah. I did that I did that for about five years or something before I changed what I was doing. Yeah, and so you so with that in mind, what did you move to? I found my way. Uh, what what I found was that um, I was. I was like them. I was interested in the functional, what I call functional architecture, how the connections, neural connections, uh, give rise to these very complicated uh, responses. And in the superior colliculus, uh, we found that there was an input from the retina and an input from the visual cortex that interacted somehow to produce this miracle. And I wanted to study the synaptic connections. The synapse is a tiny uh, structure about a micron across. And I wanted to see those uh, retinal and cortical synapses uh, contacting the neurons in the superior colliculus. And to do that, I had to learn electron microscopy. So uh, and that was a, a new field uh, then, and it was certainly new for me. So I spent a year after their lab uh, in, a, in an anatomy lab at Harvard uh, to learn the techniques of electron microscopy. and then. When I took a job at, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania in 1969, and I stayed there until 2009, 40 years, <laughs> um, uh, I, I used both techniques. I, I, did, I continued to study physiology and, and the, the structure of retinal uh, circuits. I, I moved from the cortex and the superior colliculus to study the retina. The retina yeah. is in the back of the eye, but it's it's really a part of the brain that has grown out into the eye to process signals. And it's it's a very nice structure to study by electron microscopy because um, it's the, the cerebral cortex is a millimeter and a half thick, and um, the the retina is is a tenth of that. And so you have a better chance of actually following the connections in the retina. And, and that's still, we know an awful lot now about the retina and the, the, the cortex is still uh, a challenge. You know, there are new techniques, but it's, it's still a, a, a big challenge. So that's what I did, focused for many years in the science part on the retina. But then I also moved along in, in my, um, in my uh, social, my interest yeah. in social aspects of health. Yeah. And then, Peter, how did the two sort of integrate? Right. So when I was in uh, Cleveland, uh, canvassing door to door, I was studying uh, the cortical projections to the spinal cord and brainstem. And when I went out into the community uh, and knocked on doors, they were there were in the black community, many people came to the door sort of limping or their face sagging and the speech was slurred. And back in the lab, I learned that this was uh, a, because of they had had stroke. And I learned that stroke was caused by hypertension. 
And I had never seen this in the white communities where I uh, grew up or in the, in the white community at, at Harvard. So, but I did remember that, that this, this ghetto in Central uh, in the 60s, which was black, had been a Jewish ghetto two generations before where my grandfather was also segregated and forced into a Jewish uh, house painters union. He was, a, he was an immigrant. He immigrated in 1907. And he also had had uh, hypertension and an early stroke. And so I began to think that maybe hypertension was related to social tension. And so arriving in at Penn, I began to investigate that, um, not in the street, but in the library. Yeah. Okay. And at that time, Peter, were you in a position in your career where you were responsible or where the you had autonomy in what you could do, or did you have to sort of convince people around you that this was something to be investigated? Uh, the 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 uh, U.S. Uh, Academy at that time, good universities, uh, if you were appointed assistant professor, you were expected to get a grant and do research and publish it, and the rest was sort of up to you. Nobody was paying attention, really. And so, uh, except <laughs> occasionally when my activities would come to the attention of my chair and uh, I'd be called in and uh, said, yeah, what, what what the hell are you doing? You know, and what, I getting explain, arrested, do you mean? <laughs> uh, or... Well, um, yeah, or making a statement to the student newspaper or something like that. And so, so he said, look, if you're going to do something that's going to be in the newspaper, tell me first. Yeah. <laughs> so about six months later, I, I noticed that there were um, the the uh, neurosurgeon at the University of Pennsylvania were doing frontal lobotomies, and this, this was in 1972 or something like that. Long after everybody had understood that this was a disastrous uh, thing to do, and I was I was asked to testify as an assistant professor uh, on behalf of a guy who'd been damaged by a lobotomy. So I agreed to do it. And so I dutifully went uh, to tell my chair that I was about to testify against another member of the uh, medical school. And I let the dean of the medical school know, know as well. And so uh, he he was grateful for my for the heads up, what we call a heads up uh, notification. And throughout my career, I, I did sp- speak out and... Um, I, I once spoke out in the, in the, all the way in the, in the 90s uh, against uh, a racist lecture I was attending in my class, my course. And uh, I stood up in the back of the room and stopped the lecturer from continuing this sort of racist uh, baiting. And um, it, it got everybody freaked out. The black students walked out. Went, and, uh, and I wasn't fired from my job, but the teaching faculty and my chair decided that maybe they better let me not teach in that course anymore, even though I had invented it and so on. And um, now, oh, oh, this is sort of interesting. Well, it's a lot interesting. Was the lecturer themselves cognizant of the fact that they were racist or was this just completely ignorant? Like, I'm just interested. Yes, it, it was completely ignorant. Um, wow. He was uh, making jokes. He was a neuroradiologist, and he was making mm. jokes about the the images that he was studying. This was in the early days of uh, CAT scans, and so on. You could really see the brain. Well, he said, "This is a this is the brain of um, a prostitute who was pushed down the stairs, po- possibly by one of her customers." Goodness. And the student and the students are laughing. These are first year yeah. students, 160 students. Yeah. So I, I I stood up in the back and I said, you know, you just can't, you can't talk. I said what was most outrageous. I said, are you better than a prostitute? You know, is anybody in this audience think they're better than a prostitute? You know, and it happened to be Good Friday, and so I said, you know, it's Good Friday. Um, who washed Christ's feet? A prostitute. And uh, the guy went nuts. Really, he couldn't. He couldn't stop. So I created a certain kind of chaos. But I have no regrets about it. So I was asked the next uh, Monday 
by my chair, who was a neurologist and a, and a neuroscientist, he said, well, why, why didn't you just talk to him quietly? Uh, doctors say this in the operating room all the time. And my answer was that they might say that in front of you know five students who are watching, but this was 170 first year students. And this was a teaching moment. And either I was going to call him out uh, or I wasn't. And I didn't care explaining to him uh, I don't. I don't know what he believes to this day, but I. I saw what was going on, and uh, I. I called it at the time. So, I. It was a very difficult time because um, I received from from friends and other faculty members in other departments uh, support, but I received not not a word of encouragement or support from any of my faculty members in my department. To this day, uh, I have never. I heard that, and uh, wow. that was a, so. It was quite painful to me, and um, mm. but I feel like it was a, it was the right thing to have have done. However, yeah. I was not asked back to teach in the course. Mm, wow, what a shame. Um, okay, Peter. So from there, then, because that's such a like I can imagine the distress that that would have caused at the time for you, and of course, so much of your research is in stress you know that sort of connection between the brain and our health and so can we sort of like maybe move that conversation to that part of your sort of research and of course you were talking about social injustice hypertension the link between then went to the library did you find anything at the time actually yeah that yeah that's it that's a great question that's getting back on the on the track <laughs> um in, in that period early at uh, my time at Penn I met uh, a man named Joseph Iyer, who was studying uh, what causes hypertension, what causes early death uh, in, by society, what are the contributions of social stress and inequality uh, to uh, to death of, of various sorts. And I began listening to him. He was four years younger, very, very uh, brilliant man. And uh, he began saying stuff I, I hadn't heard. And so I would go to the library and say, is this, is this right? Everything, uh, he said, for example, that the people who live hunting and gathering for life uh, don't work as hard. They have plenty of time for uh, play and social interaction. And uh, and they, uh, they don't have high, high blood pressure. And their blood pressure doesn't rise with age. We're, we're taught at medical schools, oh, you have a blood pressure here, but it just goes up and up and up. And that's natural, but it, it, it isn't true. And so I began to pursue that. And then I began to pursue, well, how does the brain, if the brain is registering social stress and inequality, how does it communicate that to the biological mechanisms that... Um, that cause a rise in pressure, a chronic rise in pressure. And I found going to the library, uh, a couple of, you know, just stunning uh, discoveries. One is that was an electron micrograph of a high, very high resolution picture of a neural synapse on a neural endocrine cell in the kidney. And that's, those cells were already known their hormone was already known to raise blood pressure and also to raise the uh, the the um, appetite for salt. Yes, I I also found uh, pictures of uh, nerve cells, uh, nerve endings covering all the blood vessels in the body. Every arterial vessel is bound in a mesh of of uh, of nerve fibers, and I found that um, essentially all the other endocrine glands and, and cells in the body have nerve fibers on them. So the brain has an immense uh, grip on, on these regulatory mechanisms and on every cell in the body. So, so th that was a very, as a scientist, a really exciting thing to understand. And, um, uh, and the other thing I saw at that point, which, uh, you know, is, is a very, uh, vivid memory is I found a, a recording, uh, a 24-hour recording of a, of a man who had uh, a, a catheter stuck into his uh, or, uh, artery in his arm. And it showed the diastolic and the systolic pressures going up and down across 24 hours. 
And it was completely clear that uh, there is no such thing as you don't have a blood pressure. You have an average blood pressure, but that's because it goes way, way, way up for the moment and then way, way down and so on. And it responds. You could see this was correlated with various events in the course of this guy's day. And you could see that every mental event was raising his pressure before he needed to do something. And uh, this was very counter to the standard idea of physiological regulation in, the, uh, in, 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 in biology. The standard idea was back then uh, called homeostasis. And that is the idea is that if you have some, some pressure or a, a level of a, of a metabolite or something, it's supposed to be within these temperature, within these narrow limits. And if it departs from the limit, above or below, some feedback mechanism in the body will detect this and correct it automatically. Okay, so that's homeostasis. And that not only was taught back then, it's still taught. It is, that's it, what it, I learned, it, yeah. Yes, that's right. And I checked back to uh, UPenn's uh, curriculum a, a couple of years ago when I was writing my book. And uh, um, it's, still, it's still taught. Yeah. Now, but is realized, that incorrect yeah. overall, though, that concept of homeostasis? Or is there room for more than one sort of theory, depending on what system we're sort of talking about? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. So uh, one of the things, I will answer it, but let me give you the other alternative, which is that um, be, with, with all of these connections to the body and all these cells and all these uh, peripheral things, is that the brain actually uh, correct, thinks ahead, predicts what's going to happen, and then it adjusts everything to be ready for it. Okay. And the and, and this is called predictive regulation, and it's it's sort of what Toyota has that slogan for the assembly line: just enough, just in time. You don't want a huge excess capacity. It takes space. It takes storage. You don't want you don't want to go short because then bad things happen. So it's better to predict and match than to wait for an error and correct. It's much, much more efficient. Uh, and, uh, and so that is, that is sort of what I, an alternative view of the body. In the beginning, I thought homeostasis is completely wrong. And Alice, so I, I named this term, homeostasis is for stability through constancy, Allostasis, no E, not Elio, allostasis, uh, is, um, is stability by variation, by flexible variation. And to me, uh, I gradually realized that if you were going to say, well, what is health? It's not having your all these parameters in, in a little narrow range. It's, it's flexible variation to optimize uh, whatever's the, the, your metabolism and so on for, for whatever is going on. With regards, like that concept intuitively makes sense for, as I understand health in terms of our ability to be resilient under times of stress. Like this is, is that sort of what you're talking about? Although what I will say is with that predictive regulation, I immediately think of AI, like how, like how well the, the brain can predict what happens next reminds me of um AI and what we're seeing with regards to prediction, but it's, you know, that's a bit yeah. of a tangent to be uh, honest. Uh, a AI is too far for me now, right? right now. <laughs> no, I get it. Um, but what about the resiliency um, idea, Peter? Is that what? Okay. Yeah. So, so the current use of resiliency is, you know, um, basically life is tough. It's uh, we're in trouble, and so we have to respond with resilience, which is to struggle against adversity. And I, I don't disagree with that, but the, but the problem is that. Uh, the body, so allostasis is about moving things up and down so that when, when you've spent some of the body's resources, then there's a time to replenish them. And there is a medial level, medium level where we were, we were, our genetics and our inheritance sets these things. So, for example, uh, human blood pressure across the globe in, in, in all you know, conditions. It's about a hundred, and it's maybe a hundred and 
10 or something over 80, but basically it's meant to be under normal, peaceful, reasonable circumstances, about 100. And uh, and if you go into today's hunter-gatherer societies in Africa or in Asia, uh, in South America, Central America, I have spent, uh, I got interested in this. And so I went in and spent some time in these societies. Their pressures are not only low, but they're flat with age. They do not rise with age. In the U.S., uh, our blood pressures start to rise at age six or seven when children enter school. They wow. leave the family and it starts to go by 19, by graduation uh, at 18, 25% of them uh, pressures are in the hypertensive range. And I actually think that, if I'm not mistaken, that our our concept of normal with regards to blood pressure, like a lot of the markers or bio, blood biomarkers have sort of shifted up as the population health has sort of declined. So instead of being like, yeah, so many people are, you know, uh, have high blood pressure or, uh, or I don't know, liver markers or whatever, they've sort of moved that population norm. So more people are normal, but not necessarily healthy. To some extent, but, uh, there's a very. I want to get back to the resilience thing, but I'll, oh, I'll yeah. answer this question yeah. first. Um, for blood pressure, medicine worldwide acknowledges that uh, pressures above about 120 uh, uh, are, are are hypertensive, and if you move, they they formally define it as 140 or for pharmacological treatment. But it's very clear. It's been clear for 50 years that the higher the pressure the more uh, damage is done by various mechanisms such as uh, enhancing atherosclerosis, causing strokes, a, a number of different things. And it's bad for the brain, it's bad for the kidney, uh, and, and so on. So there's no question that blood pressure sh for health long-term should be low. And so, but the, the uh, standard uh, approach to this in the 50 years that I've been involved is to treat it with drugs. And so, um, so, so the first, you have a hypertensive patient and you give, a, uh, you give the person a diuretic and that causes them to uh, spill more salty water basically into the urine. It acts on the kidney. And so that reduces the plasma volume. Blood pressure comes down. The brain thinks, "Oh, you know, uh, uh, we need to be, you know, uh, you know moving. You know, we're under stress, and if that pressure is coming down for that reason, I, I will raise it by increasing the heart rate and and the and the force of contraction. So you get uh, shots of adrenaline that do that. And so you give a you give another drug uh, called a beta blocker." It blocks the synapses from responding to uh, the norepinephrine. And the result is, yes, the heart rate comes down, blood pressure comes down, um, and, uh, and, the, and performance comes down. So I walk with many of my friend, male friends at, at 80 are taking this drug for one reason or another. And you know, if we come to a slight rise you know, on our walk, they have to stop. The next thing is, okay, uh, you've you blocked the kidney, you've blocked the heart, uh, blood pressure goes up. Well, that's because the vessel, blood vessels are constricting. So you can block that with another bunch of drugs, and you can block salt intake. But what you end up with is basically a sick person um, who's being treated by polypharmacy. And it's it's a very precarious thing because, for example, the beta blocker, improves the blood pressure, but it makes the diabetes uh, gl glucose worse. And so those interact. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, the, the homeostatic understanding where the brain doesn't really matter is really um, uh, generates a polypharmacy, drug after drug after drug. And, and each, each problem is called a, a disease to be fixed by some of these drugs. And of course, one of the problems is uh, it's really being driven a great deal by the uh, the manufacturer, the drug companies, and um, it's uh, it's very disheartening to watch uh, our health being totally 
in the hands of these, these companies. Now, back to resilience. Resilience is part of its, it's part of the response to a challenge. Okay, it's if home if allostasis is, has things varying, and as we go to sleep and we're sort of peaceful on vacation, it pull, pulls things down here to a normal level. It allows us to regenerate. But if the next day is driving it up and keeping it up high, day after day after day, the the uh, the the system uh, adapts to that and it does come to expect this new level. And it's very dangerous. So resilience, um, that is what resilience is really is. It's its teaching you how to stay up there like that as though the, there was no cost to it. It's very costly, both emotionally and physically. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Because I was thinking about it from an sort of almost an adaptive response no, in, in that you rise to the challenge, then things settle and calm down. But that's not how you see it. It's okay if it happens once in a while. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, yeah. You need it. It's part of the system. It's part of the dynamic range. You know, it's expected to go up there. But if you make it stay there as a way of life, it's dam- It's damaging. Damaging. And, and that is what you would have been seeing both sort of personally in your sort of experience with different communities and, and people, but also in the literature as well. Um. With the social injustice, that. with the social injustice. So you're so as you're sort of understanding more, you're like, well, the problem with the stroke, with the people that I'm seeing, is it is that level of stress that their lives are yes. under have sort of related and, and caused that. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I wrote a paper uh with Joseph Fire on this in, in 1977, and then uh, on the distribution of stress-related mortality. It's called social organization and stress-related mortality. And then I that led me to the question of what are these local biological mechanisms through which these behavioral things are expressed. And so I published that with Joe in, uh, in 1981, Biological Basis of Stress-Related Mortality. And so many of these ideas uh, uh, are documented in great detail in that paper. And and then it took me a while to come to this uh, to call it name it allostasis and I and I did that because I wanted something to stand up to homeostasis. I, there's another point I, I have come to understand more clearly, and I published this uh, in a new last paper review in 19, 2019 that there is a role for for homeostasis, and specifically because many. Many features of our body, many conditions, are really not predictable that well, and so you're bound to have errors. If if errors are unavoidable because of the the, the things are intrinsically unpredictable, you need you need negative feedback to correct them. So uh, and so uh, there are various uh, examples of where the two interact in a, in a positive way, but you just can't. You can't get a theory uh, of uh, our human species based on simply on negative feedback. No, for sure. And Peter, when you published this paper, how well was it received? Was it well received and accepted, or has it been a constant battle? I'm sure it hasn't been a constant battle. I mean, we know so much more now these days about stress and the impact on health, but at the time, it sounds to me like these were very new ideas. They were uh, adding to the pile of evidence in a very small part of the field where nobody was really interested, you know? So I published, uh, Joe and I published a paper, our first paper in a journal called Journal, I think, of Radical Political Economics. It's oh. a very small, you know, thing. <laughs> yes. um, but, you know, it's still cited, actually. And the next paper on biological basis was in the on a journal called Social Science and Medicine. It's a very respectable journal. It still exists, but um, it's not cited every day in Nature. I mean, it's a, it was a fairly obscure paper. But over the years, so I've put all of my writings on this topic uh, on a on a on a, um, a website called a Research Gate, and yes. anybody can dial into my thing, and they can get in any of the papers that are on there. There's a whole list of papers in my my. Uh, 
my uh, other podcasts and, and and recent writings on this. So it's it's available. But back then, and it's and it's also, you know, I go on Twitter to try to publicize this stuff. Back then, I uh, know you'd publish this thing and you you'd wait for the splash, but it would be uh, a, dec- a decade. You know, yeah, a decade. yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, Peter, you're like it's. So did your anthropological sort of interest because obviously you studied zoology and biology um at university so you um and of course the brain but then you went on to spend time with traditional hunter-gatherer sort of populations did that sort of enhance your interest in I'm thinking about evolutionary biology there was that what you were sort of thinking about as well that, that's a very a good question I um I was reading all this stuff uh, about blood pressure and and society. There was a very good group at Harvard uh, uh, headed by Irvin DeVore and Richard Lee, and they were studying the, the so-called Kung Bushmen in, in Botswana in the desert, Kalahari Desert. And I read all those studies, and they were just fascinating, and they supported the idea of low blood pressure, very highly social, very unstressed uh, people. and. And so a, a whole field of evolutionary uh, anthropology grew up around studying these sort of peoples. And they wrote books, and I read every one of them. I mean, I was just fascinated. Uh, at the time, I was uh, married, had two young kids. And so I couldn't I couldn't exactly, you know, change fields and start anew. And I mean, but I was really... Uh, uh, so what I was then began looking for is what are the connections between the biology I know and the way human beings uh live you know and lives the 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 interest of these people who now still live this way is that um that is the way we live for 200,000 years since our species emerged until very very recently so most of our our evolutionary history in the population uh the crossing of the pacific to australia the, uh, to the new world all of these things were done as people were hunter gatherers and with a very primitive technology. And so I think it's of interest. Uh, there's a very good group sponsored by the US uh, uh, Nationalist of Health studying, for example, long term studies of a, of a group in, in the Bolivian lowlands of, of the Amazon named the Chimani. And it's, they've been studying these people for 20 years. And, and the further they get out in the Chimani territory, uh, the lower the blood pressures, the lesser uh, and the greater the cardiovascular fitness, and uh, these people are very healthy, <laughs> and they live and they live quite a long time, and they have careers. The career starts at twenty when you go off into the forest to learn how to hunt, and uh, and it, and this a student, uh, a young hunter at twenty, just starting, his productivity increases over the next 40, 30, 40 years. And so, uh, sorry, probably 25 to 30 years. And so what that indicates is that hunting and gathering is really a, a career. And it's not something now we have people stamping a passport or scanning a barcode, you know, uh, that is not a career. And it doesn't, it doesn't do justice to this tremendous brains that we have. It's just, uh, it's a very unhealthy way to live. And so, Sorry, to get back to the question, how did I get into the anthropology? By the late 70s, I'd read all these things. I I just, I was dying, you know, to see a person, people, a community uh, that was closer to that. And so I I uh, I took off a month. Uh, my, my career was you know, roughly under control by then in science. And uh, I took off a month and went to Panama because I had been told that uh, it's a small place and, and you can get lost into the pretty deep, jungly places pretty quick. It doesn't take a month. You know, you can do you can do it in a day. You know, you can walk a day's hike and you were in Indian territory. What was called that? So I did that, and uh, I visit. I, I, I hiked across the mountains from the Pacific to the Atlantic, uh, Caribbean side, and back. I uh, and I traveled to the Darien uh, Gap, which is now being, you know, publicized because it's a, a source of migrants coming up through 
from Colombia. But then it was quite wild, quite uh, very uh, indigenous groups, um, uh, in particular the Embara, and uh, who were you know, living basically very, very simply with uh, cooperative work and uh, uh, very small family communities. And so I got to live with them for a couple of days and I worked with them and I, I was fed by them. I tasted that their food also is salty, um, but their blood pressure is not high. And so basically for the next several decades, uh, every chance I could, I could get to sort of go to some other little group uh, and, and see what it was like, uh, I did. And my wife uh, uh, came to uh, enjoy this. We went off on Costa Rica and Honduras and and, uh, and Panama. So yeah. yeah, as I understand it, you do you still have a house somewhere, and you sort of divide your time. Is that still the case? Yes, um, we uh, right now. I'm living in uh, Amherst, Massachusetts. It's a very it's a university town, an agricultural town. Very pleasant uh, in the summer and beautiful in the fall. Um, but about almost 20 years ago, we were on a spring break in Panama in, in the mountains, the Western mountains, and we, we were shown a farm <laughs> that was for sale. Uh, it was of navel oranges, and we bought it. We didn't do any research or anything like that. We, it, you know, it was something we could afford, and we bought it. So, so now we live there. We built a small house, and uh, uh, it, it's, the farm is sort of worked and managed by a by an indigenous uh, family and um, so that's that's what we've done so we do we go there from november uh through through may oh that sounds nice and i imagine that uh the weather is a whole lot better than it is in massachusetts yeah i mean it's sometimes windy sometimes rainy but it's it's milder yeah yeah that's yeah right. yeah oh nice uh so your understanding of health then peter you mentioned four pillars in a presentation that I saw you give, could we go over them like briefly? Like if it's not salt and it's not, not that it's not salt, but you know what I mean? Like it's, you know, what is it about um, society that could sort of enhance health under these four pillars? Uh, to be honest, I don't remember these four pillars. Amazing. But I, but I can make it up, you know, as I go along. Um, Social inclusion. Uh, well, even before that, I, yeah. I would like to say that our physiological regulation, our behavioral interactions, um, and our social level of interactions, uh, it's very important that they generate on a daily basis small little pulses of the chemical everybody knows as dopamine, because dopamine acts on the brain um, and uh, to uh, some people describe it as pleasure, but it's really it's a relief. Your, your your part of your brain is driving you. Get out there, find work, find this, do that, find a mate, do this, and and so we're driven by these brain circuits in various degrees. And when you get a little pulse of dopamine, uh, you stop and say, ah, you know, and. And so, uh, and so it's the satisfaction of the unexpectedly positive thing. A hunter-gatherer is working around all day and he shoots a rabbit. Oh, my God. We got dinner. Yeah, 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 yeah. His wife finds a root, you know, okay, we got a soup, you know. Uh, so, you know, just to make it short. But so we need these sources of dopamine and we get them from uh, social interactions, we get them from empathic behaviors, uh, altruistic behaviors. When you do that, the person getting it gets a dopamine, but the giver uh, gets possibly more. You know, and so there's a whole level of these interactions which require a, a slower pace and um, and more em empathic, cooperative behavior. And that's how we evolved, okay? And there's many things drive us away from that today, but that's where we have to get back. And and that that could allow health, okay? Just um, interact, and any interaction that is counter to 
that we were we were also the, these behaviors I'm talking about were done also on the basis of equality that the families in a community that was moving and migrating and hunting and gathering they required each other's cooperation because one day I might not get a rabbit but you got a you got a pig you know and so there was very rigorous sharing to to iron out the fluctuation the economic fluctuations uh, and, and so on so now we just go to the supermarket and we don't need each other in that way we don't interact in that way and, and so we need to find ways to get back to more equal to more uh to, uh, to rely to processes that we're humans rely on each other in a cooperative way and, and more than we are doing yeah and okay. uh, so i would yeah yeah, it, but it's interesting you mentioned dopamine, Peter, because of course it's a bit of a buzzword actually right now, or it feels like it with Huberman podcast sure. and every uh, other, yeah, I know, <laughs> and and all the rest of it, and actually just the that we can get dopamine, that dopamine hit from so many different places that do not require social interaction or or the the tenets of health, which which you know you sort of. Um, underpin your you know how you talk about it which is well, well let me address that i think yeah. it's very it's a very uh, important um I- incorrect way of thinking about it that these people that people say oh yeah we're always searching for these great jolts of of dopamine yeah 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 well but they don't ask why and i want to tell you why that is it's because in a community where daily life involves multiple hits across the days of dopamine from social interactions for finding finding food that you can't go to a supermarket it's unpredictable and you find it and and from sharing and all these different things those people are not searching for giant hits of dopamine those those people those people now are raising coca leaf They've used the coca leaf for thousands of years, but they are not cocaine addicts, and they are not, and they raise poppies, but they're not, they're not heroin addicts. So, people who live in a, in a way where they give each other small hits of dopamine are accustomed to these. Like it's like blood pressure. If it's around a hundred, average, that's good. So if the dopamine is you know going up and down, that's what you need. But uh, but. That's enough. Mm-hmm. Once you lose, once you go from uh, a life where you get to go out every day and try to find your dinner um, to uh, scanning a barcode, you've lost it. You know, um, so uh, so the the social isolation now uh, is is really driving, and, and the preoccupation with these. So you do get a hit from a from a tweet or a retweet or, you know, something or else. But uh, it, that is supporting this social isolation that we've gotten to, which is, which is really, uh, and it's a source of rising in the U.S., rising uh, suicide, rising drug, uh, alcoholism. The, all of these things are not because look, looking for these little hits, they're desensitized. They wouldn't even notice a little hit because they're up at this level of, banging their brains with these with these drugs that raise do raise dopamine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. It's that instead of little pulses, we're getting these massive hits. That's right. And we're not- but we search them out. We search them out because we're not getting the little hits. We because we've wiped them from our society. You know? Uh I mean I'm gonna give you an example if we have a, a moment. Yes. Uh, I, I just came back from uh, from Denmark, where I was giving some lectures, and I came back with a uh, a, a serious, you know, <laughs> urological issue. And uh, in Denmark, I was treated in a hospital, like in five minutes, for nothing. When I got back here, I told my, in fact, before from from Denmark, I emailed my Harvard, you know, medical school run huge practice that covers all of from Boston out here, two hours out here. And I could not get anybody to talk to me uh, for a week, you know, 
And you, you go in and you leave these messages and nobody answers. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. They answer too late. And um, the anxiety, I've spent <laughs> two weeks um, just because you get, says, well, call here. So you call and you get it onto a call center. And then it, if you get there, you're on that for an hour and a half. And so after seeing, uh, I was in Helsinki, Finland, and, and, and Aris, Denmark. And after seeing how that does not happen there, by and large. I mean, I didn't see that much, but I was treated extremely well, very promptly, and and by by people without having to go through a phone tree. So this is really, uh, I feel, the last two weeks of dealing with the impossibility of social interaction is built in. You cannot have one. Uh, I think it's it's been terrible, you know, and uh, I'm sure it's cost me, you know, a month of my life, you know, yeah, it's just yeah. really bad. And so uh, this is now, you know, this is my personal experience of this destruction of social interactions. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate. And I, and that is um, obviously a, a massive deal to you, a small example of what people are experiencing every single day. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, Peter, like, sure. so if you're looking, like, if I'm thinking about, like, you're 83 and you've got this body of work behind you that supports your premise of health, and then do you sort of feel a little bit of despair at the idea, like, I just can't see how we'd get back to a lifestyle that would allow for um, health in the way that you think about it. I don't know. What do you think? We're not going back to be hunter gatherers. No, certainly not. But the idea of but, yeah, can we exist in this environment the way that would be optimally healthy? I suppose is is absolutely okay. Absolutely, you know, uh, we we need more equality, less inequality. Well, I saw it in in Finland and Sweden. I mean, in in, in Denmark. I mean, they're not. It's not that there are no differences between people and ability or thing, but you you just feel that the the city is organized for people's to encourage healthy th things and to be supportive. You know, yeah. people are paid salaries. You know, um, and so uh, that that's a simple matter of of uh, taxing the people who have a gazillion dollars and redistributing in some reasonable way as as they do in Europe you know they they're much closer to having a reasonable life and so uh and their and their death rates their death rates are falling the US death rate is actually rising you know and uh and for the, and the from the from suicide and alcoholism and so on it's rising out of sight yeah for very and for the very young people yeah, yeah. No, is it? Actually, yeah, very good point. But but we 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 can do it. It's just a matter of people deciding to you know, do it. Uh, to do it, and how? I mean, uh, you yeah, know, just to change your economic policies, change your social policies. Nothing. You know, nobody has to die. Uh, it's just you know they have to decide what they want. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, therefore, I guess if we reached a place where most countries had a similar social structure and, and policy structure, then do we, do, then is it in your opinion that other things which we focus on, like diet and exercise, become not less important, but they're not as influential on health if we consider the sort of overarching... Well, I think diet, I mean, um, I think the problems of lack of exercise lack of physical activity, over obesity due to various unhealthy eating habits. Um, these these are most prevalent among the parts of our society who have the least education, the least opportunity, the worst jobs in every yeah. way. Yeah. And that's where that's where the bad stuff is. When I go to a university uh, where most of the people uh, or in research jobs or teaching, they're full of energy. Uh, they're they're not obese and they're not unhealthy. 
And their eating is naturally, you know, something halfway reasonable, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're not just doing takeout, they cook their dinners, you know. So I've seen this over and over and over again in, in, in uh, institutions where people are engaged, they have work they like, they're interested, and uh, they ride their bikes. I mean, and they're all fit, you know. Mm-hmm. It, it, in the, you know, the communities where uh, it's just a mess, uh, people know those people, uh, you know, eat, take out and, uh, and take, uh, all, all these drugs and they're, and they're, they're really, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. in trouble. Yeah, trouble. Yeah. yeah. No, I, that makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Um, so Peter, do you think that, I mean, if it's, I guess this is my, and, and don't worry, I'm, I'm very, I, I know that we have to, we're up on time, but do you think you'll see it? in your lifetime, a shift of policy that will allow these changes? Uh, no, yeah. I don't. I, I actually think that we're, we're facing uh, a period of tremendous chaos. I think uh, there's going to there's gonna be issues of population decline, greater immigration, the climate. No, I think, uh, no, we're entering a very dangerous uh, period, you know, mm. and uh, I must say, uh, that's one of uh, part of getting older and realizing <laughs> I've been pushing at this needle, you know, all my life and uh, I, I can't move it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, I, I don't think it's true. I mean, I think I have introduced a new idea, some thinking, but it's not enough to, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Tina, I've yeah. really appreciated your work and um, I've read a few of your articles. And of course, you've got your book, What is Health? Uh, yes. That's very readily available. And as Wait. you, s- yes, yeah. that is it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, easy to read as well. Mm-hmm. So, um, oh, thank you. Um, uh, so I would just add that what is, we, we just last week, uh, did an audio ver- version that we're putting together. And so, uh, yeah, so that will be available, I hope, not too long. And I just, uh, MIT just signed a contract with a Chinese publisher to, br- to bring it out in, in Chinese. So, and, and last year it came out, uh, I published it in Spanish as well, que es la salud. So, uh, yeah, so I'm... I'm still plugging, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. And Peter, yeah, just yeah. Uh, this is the final question. What do you do day to day to look after your health? Because I have to say, and maybe it's just a reflection of my age as well, is that when I speak to people who are older than I am, like, I mean, you ser- you certainly don't seem like you're 83. I mean, that's like, it is phenomenal, actually. So, <sighs> so how do you, is it genetics or what do you do day to day? Well, everything is some genetics, but the fact is that my wife and I pay quite a bit of attention to getting exercise. Uh, Sally goes out for a walk every, every day, very, you know, big, long walks, and I uh, I don't quite keep up with her, uh, but I I make sure to get out and to, and to you know, we get our steps. We're com- competitive about our steps, you know, uh, 14,000 steps on Sunday. Wow. You know, oh, that's amazing. I'm also so, uh, quite competitive about steps, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if, if if Sally needs the car and I have an appointment in town, how am I going to get back to my house? It's four miles. I walk. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, uh, unheard of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> but so, and then uh, I say at night, uh, when I start getting ready for bed, I now have really to take care of what teeth I have left. I mean, they're, they're all in my jaw, but they're falling apart. And so I, I wash them and I floss them and I do this and I do that and I rinse them. And I also, uh, I lift, I do some exercises with weights, small five pound weights Brilliant. for maybe 15 minutes or so. And then I garden uh, off. I have a nice vegetable garden yeah. and that's, that, that can be good exercise. Yeah. Uh, and we do the same thing in, in Panama. So no, I think it takes uh, staying healthy. Uh, and and I I drink actually. I mean, I drink alcohol. Yeah. But I've discovered actually uh, that uh, the less I drink, the the better I function. Yeah. And yeah. The better I sleep, and uh, the better I dream. And so uh, I, I make an effort uh, to keep 
to you know to have a glass of wine at dinner and not really more. So yeah, nice. I'm not telling anybody what to do, but uh, I, I that's what I think we yeah. found. Yeah. Um, yeah. Peter, I could talk to you for hours. And it was funny when I sent you through my notes and you were like, there was no way we're going to get through this in an hour. And I, uh-huh. and you were so right. Um, but I really, really enjoyed um, uh, getting to speak to you and, and about your work and your life. And um, I will put a link in the show notes to your research gate and to the Amazon link to your book as well. And, um, and we can look in future for the Audible version to come out, which is yes, great, really great. great. Yeah. Well, I've enjoyed this very much, and uh, I think it, yeah, it worked out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'll send, I'll send you the link. That sounds lovely. Thank you so much, Thank, Peter. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Take care now. All right, guys, hopefully you enjoyed that and hat tip to my co-host Bevan McKinnon on Fitter Radio for alerting me to Professor Sterling and his availability for a podcast. He was very open to that and I was just so thankful. Next week on the podcast, we speak to another professor, David Dunstan, all about sedentary behaviour and its links with health, which you know I'm hugely passionate about this sort of the area of movement and just being active in everyday life. So we talk a lot about that. Until then, though, you can catch me over on Instagram, Threads and Twitter at Mickey Willardin, Facebook at Mickey Willardin Nutrition. Head to my website, mickeywillardin.com book a call with me. Why not? Let's get your nutrition sorted. All right, team, you have a great week.